here. I so appreciate it. I so appreciate Dennis being with us. Uh, he's an amazing artist, amazing guy. This, his, his process, which we'll talk about a little bit. And, um, then when we're, when we're talk, when we're finished boring you, there's a video in the next room showing him working and it really helps you understand his, his process. So Dennis, I welcome you, my friend. Thank you. And we're on tape, you know, so behave yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about where, your your background. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? I mean, as much as you have. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so actually, this is pretty easy for me to remember because, uh, well, I lived through it, of course. But what I'm saying is, I just got through filling out a grant, which required all this information. What happened to me from the day one to the to the present day. So I guess that's what you're asking, right? Essentially. I'm asking whatever you want to answer. Yeah. So essentially, I grew up in a small town in Kansas, and uh, I spent a lot of time working and making things. I just loved to make things. I didn't really care what it was as long as I could make it and just had something that was a driving force behind me. So I kept on making and making, and then I went, my brother was a physicist, a astrophysicist at the time, oh and, and uh, so I wanted to also be an astrophysicist, uh, which I failed at really bad. And uh, then I wanted to be an engineer, then I wanted to be uh, an architect, and it went on and on and on, like I changed my major five or six times in the first year of college. <laughs> And I thought I need to do something that, that, you know, that I can figure out what I want to do, what I want to be. And so finally I gave up all these aspirations and hopes for this or that and decided I'd just go to this college what, that was known for the creative arts. And uh, I went there and I just fell in love right away with making things. And But here's the one, one of the important parts is that when I was there, I was taking classes, of course, in undergrad school, and I was taking a painting class. And, uh, you know, when I want something, I really want something. I wanted to be a great painter, and I still want to be a great artist. But aside from that, I wanted to be a great painter at the time. And so I would take these classes, and I'd always feel lousy in them. You know, like I'd put the paint on, and, okay, and then the instructor would come by and give me a critique and, okay, I'll change and I'll try this and, you know, I'll do this. But then I realized that I didn't like the paint. Because when you put the paint on, it just stays there. It doesn't, like, do anything. <laughs> I wanted to, like, bubble up, roll off, or do something that gives me pleasure. And it took me quite a while to figure out that it really what I wanted to do I was, had to do with heat. So I was taking ceramic classes. And I really loved taking the ceramic class. But I didn't want to take it because at that time, ceramic was thought of as the minor arts, which no longer exists, hopefully, in anybody's mind. But so I started, uh, you know, working with clay. And then I realized that it was really just this heat that was most interesting. And then, so I started welding ceramic work, and I, I used uh, industrial <laughs> torches to weld the clay. So this gives me a big opportunity. Big opportunity <coughs> is that I can work on clay right in front of me. There's no kill, there's no firing, there's no cooling down period, nothing. I can work right there. And so I started doing this, and I, you know, I was getting a fair bit of attention for doing this because I wanted to have this, this thing happen with heat. And, and to me, what happens when there's a fire heating something and it's getting hot, that to me is like a magic moment. It's when all the possibilities exist versus putting paint on, it just sits there. 
And it took a long time to figure out that, you know? And so I've been working with heat for a long time, mostly in ceramic, but over the last 10 years, working on the work that you see here with torches, with industrial torches that are used to, you know, directly project smoke to the surface of paper, or to uh, do that with colored smoke as well. It's done in a little bit different way, but the same thing. So I, I'm like, I like that. That's my way that I want to work. I want to burn something. I want to heat it up. <laughs> I got to do something to it like that. So that's how I got to this point today. And then, of course, it's the subtleties of working with black smoke or with colored smoke or with the, with the rim, which I call a burned rim, which is where the torch is going oh. around very close on the paper and burning it. How did you come you know? to be using this form, this, this flower form or mandala form or sea form? This, this well, sea it's form. Like, like two things. One is the circle is everything. You know, it's like, what is in a circle? Uh, it's, it's the never ending, you know, continuous one. And it offers the opportunity to put your information in there. And if it's in a circular format, you know, that's it. It's defined in that respect, but... Do you see them as being specific objects specific, or as a, just purely a, a biomorphic form? Yeah. Well, that's, that, that is one because of the... Because is it a flower or is it not yeah, a flower? It, it's, it's not a flower. No. <laughs> not a flower. It really is a circular, you know, mandala-like thing. And, in fact, you know, I've uh, been told that some people can stand and look at these pieces for quite a long time, contemplating and thinking about things. But, but the circular piece started originally first when I wanted to have something. I wanted to lose control over making something. So I put it on this big wheel. To lose control? Lose control, yeah. Gain control, actually, but I lose it, but gain it in the same time. So I have this big wheel made of metal that I can spin slow or fast. And these, these papers, most all of these work on that in some way. And so I can work here, work there. And as it comes around, the circular format just winds up being one of the things that I have preferred. And I've heard that people think these are flowers. I think they're mandolins. I think they're just circular forms. And I can see how people want to, well, I mean, you know, well, people all want us, to know what they are, right? All of I mean, us right want away. to categorize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to do that right away. Yeah. I mean, the very first thing when you don't see something, you want to know, well, what is it? And that's the interesting That's part. a tree. Yeah. That's, a, yeah. Right. So. And these, wow. these are not necessarily following that format. Yeah. How did these new color works? By the way, they're all, these are all quite new yeah. and quite beautiful. How did they come about? And how is it that, what do you have to do to use the color? Well, they came about by accident. So two, three, four years ago, I wanted to start working with color, colored smoke. And so in doing that, I just started making some marks and some images and then one of the techniques that I always use is to cut out. When I was uh, going to undergrad school, I was a photographer on campus. And uh, uh, don't so, let me bother you. So I would, I would uh, do my campus work. And then in the evening, when my boss left, I would go into the dark room and take out big rolls of paper and throw chemicals on them to see what happens. Something happened, you know? Something has to happen, they can't be paint. And, and so these really magical things happen in the dark room. I can remember cutting them out. I can remember if I would have had the wherewithal at that age uh, to know that I could send those to some really nice galleries, I would have been like ahead of the game, right there. They were really dynamic. So still, you know, it's this action that something has to happen during the time of 
making these things. So I forgot where, what was the question? How you got the color? How you got the color? Oh, okay. So this is with colored smoke powder. So you can buy it in, in whatever color you want. It comes just like a powder. And then you can mix it with another color, and then you can burn that. So the way this all happens, the way all of this color happens is that I have a sheet of paper, and then I put another sheet of paper on top of it. So the original first paper is this paper, and then on top of that I have another sheet of paper, and I put a colored smoke on it, a colored powder. And then I heat that up, and it produces a lot of smoke. And the smoke goes right down into the paper. And through the first layer, into the second layer sometimes. And so this is a matter of just developing this idea. And to me, making all of the mistakes and losing a lot of paper in the process and a lot of time is really very beneficial. How often do you burn a piece of paper? Nowadays, not a lot, but I just make mistakes, that's all. Uh, <laughs> yeah. this, this work here is all archival paper. It's about 250 GSM, which is like an eighth of an inch, 16th, uh, 16th of an inch in thickness. Then how does the curve change? Or what makes it Good question. So here's another thing that takes up a lot of time is that making, when I, when I started showing this work, I realized I couldn't just put smoke on paper and then show it and sell it because people are going to buy this, put it up on their wall, and they're going to see this smoke come off. <laughs> you know, not a good deal. So uh, it took me about a year and a half to get to where I could figure out how to solve that problem. And it, the solution is there's a glue-like material, and then there's marble dust. And these two things are mixed together and coated on the paper. And you really can't see it. You roll it on the paper? Roll it, yeah, with a roller, you know, like you paint your house. Yeah. And marble uh, dust and glue. Yeah. But it's made by uh, a company for me. I don't make it. And so this has a, a very, some, see the color goes through the paper. So on some of these, it isn't required. But what happens with the, the marble dust, it creates, you have a surface like this, and when the marble dust is there, you have a surface like this. So the color just goes right in there, it stays. Yeah. So you roll it on the paper before you burn it, or after? Yeah, right. Before, yeah. and then let it dry. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a color oval like an envelope. Well, the color is uh, smoke, and it's just going every which way, and. As you work with it for a long time, I think I'm answering your question. Let me know if I'm not. But when you when you put this material on paper and burn it, then the smoke goes down there, and you can only have a general idea of where this is going. And and over time, you can be a little more precise. But I don't want to be precise. So there's this happy zone where Do you, you are and you're not. Do you believe in controlled accident? Yeah. Yeah. Most all of the work, uh, I have to tell you this, I, I do like for each one of these pieces, probably about somewhere between 30 and 60 pieces are made to get there because I'm very willing <coughs> to lose work, to give it up. But I'm looking for that time when everything just works right. And when it works right, after it's done, you look at it and you just know it's right. And then it's good. You know, anything before that is like, uh, you know, when you say it, it's, I like this, I like this. But then when you say, God, I really like this. <laughs>
<laughs> then that's ready to go. It's just interesting to me that yeah. you're creating a piece that you can't Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's kind of I like that. You know, he, he wears a welder's helmet. So, yeah. so I actually wear a... It's something uh, like that. Pepper, P-E-P-R, you know, which covers your whole head. And the respirator part is in the back with a hose going up to your head and, and equipment because I don't want to breathe this stuff. So it's not supposed to be toxic. Yeah, but why breathe it? You know, so I don't care. See, I get very excited about talking about this because I'm really loving it. So whatever questions you have. Yeah. Barbara? Well, the smoke offers that opportunity. You know, it's basically, you know, people have said to me, how do you get such a severe line using smoke on the edge? Well, you just use this part of the torch that's closest to the paper. But it's, uh, to me, it's that, you know, that paint that just sets there versus something that is a chance. And that chance is supreme. The opportunity to take a chance situation, take the environment around you, take your feelings inside of your head, and your body, and all of this, and put it out there, and hoping that something will come out that you really like. That's 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 okay with me. I like that, and I'd rather do that than know what I'm going to do. So, yeah. Do you know of any other artists that aren't you? Yeah. There are others. Yeah, there are not using colored smoke, but they're using smoke. There's one in England. There's one in the two, two in the U.S. Maybe I know. Yeah. 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 We not know, many. We, we showed mean, a, we showed another artist at the first time I showed Dennis. It was a two-person show with Steven Spacek, and he uses smoke, but he used stencils make sense the smoke would go through them yes and he yeah. uses candle which is a candle. yeah and a candle yeah right he's smarter than you are yeah that's <laughs> thank <cute>. you <laughs> you don't have to wear all that equipment who else come on somebody Well, uh, are you talking about little dark spots, you see? Those dark spots are actually where the, the smoke intensifies a great deal. I mean, it just, boom, right down through the paper does that. I'm just curious how the colored smoke reacts differently to the paper than the black smoke. Yeah. This, the, the colored smoke goes through. I mean, it yes. becomes a part of this paper. If you were to look on the back of these, you'd see not exactly the same thing, but similar kind of colors existing on the back side. The sheet of paper below that sheet of paper, you see something <coughs> like the same thing, but faint. So it just goes down like crazy. It's incredible. You see the edge, the back of the paper, of the flower. I'm sorry? Can you, Can you see this edge, edge on the back of the paper? Turn the back of the paper. Yeah. 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 Oh no, the black smoke resides on the surface. It does not go down in. Yeah. But the, the uh, like this is one that does not have absorbent ground, which is the blue with the marble dust on it. And so the colors that are produced are more subtle than if you had the absorbent ground on it. It makes the colors much more intensified. Like most of these have that, that one in the back has it. 
to the others, probably not. Do you have to use like fans or anything like that to sort of direct the smoke through the paper, or it just does that on its own? No, it just does it. Wow. So working working with smoke is has good and bad parts to it. For the public, I mean, there's not many people that know how to decipher what's going on with smoke. If you know, how do you do this, right? That's what the big question is oftentimes at openings, so. Do you, uh, would you prefer that people see these, not know how they're made, not what the material is, or is the process and the material important for you for, well, for the viewer? Yeah, that's that's really, I mean, I just like for you to look at it and enjoy it and like it. And that's it, right there. But caught up in all of this is deciphering how this thing is made. I mean, no matter what you, what I say, you're going to want to figure this out somehow. And it's a, like if you were to look at paintings, if all of these were paintings, you would have the background to configure in your brain what and how and when, probably. Because you have a vast experience at looking at painting, you know, from childhood on up. If you do the same thing with smoke, your first question is, where do I start? Smoke? Well, I don't understand where that came from. Why does it burn the place down? And so forth and so on. So. So people oftentimes want to know this. They want to know it because they don't have any experience at this before. So where do you go? You go to the source and try to find out. And uh, so that's the difficult part because oftentimes it takes up a lot of uh, energy for people to try to figure this stuff out. And I don't like it. I'd like for you to just walk in and say, oh, yeah, that's colored smoke. Yellow, yeah, I like yellow, but you know, <laughs> I prefer the blue over here and, you know, and do that. But no, we've got to always talk about this because this is a matter of education on how this stuff is done. Hopefully, it helps answer some of the questions. I'm going to suggest that people quickly get themselves another cup of coffee and we're going to reassemble in the presentation room where we have a large TV screen and you can see Dennis working, which is quite wonderful.